If we were to ask you to think quick on your feet and name us a couple of fabulously rich people who recently made their wealth in the glamorous world of skincare and cosmetics, we'd bet the first thought coming to your mind would be someone like billionaire singer-turned-beauty icon Rihanna, or perhaps the more controversial claim that Kardashian clan member Kylie Jenner became at one point in 2019, a billionaire from Kylie Cosmetics line. However, what if we were to tell you that there is one particular family with literally 100 times more wealth than pop singers like Riri, and would make reality TV fortunes like that of the Kardashians comparable to the coins stuffed away in your niece's piggy bank? Indeed, in today's episode of Old Money Luxury, we'll step into the intriguing and dramatic $250 billion world of family-owned business, L'Oreal. Our story begins with the family's founder, a man whose meteoric rise to fame and fortune in the cosmetics world is forever shadowed by his dark alliance with Nazi Germany. Then the story shifts to his daughter, the family's original matriarch, who finds herself ensnared in a deceptive romance, betrayed by a charming celebrity photographer turned alleged conman. And yet, within this whirlwind of emotional turmoil and shadowy pasts, the family story takes an unexpected turn when this same dynasty gives the world its first woman with a net worth of over $100 billion, Françoise Betancourt Myers. Therefore, this isn't just a tale of financial success, it's a story tinged with unanswered questions and the lingering aftermath of past decisions, as we describe the wild history of the L'Oreal dynasty, the family of the world's richest women. Just a few days before the clock struck midnight on the 1st of January, 2024, Françoise Betancourt Myers, heiress to the legendary L'Oreal Cosmetics Empire, vaulted into the financial stratosphere becoming the first woman in history to tip the scales with a net worth north of 100 billion US dollars. This eye-popping figure, courtesy of the Bloomberg Billionaires Index and the financial fireworks, can be traced back to L'Oreal's stock, which skyrocketed to its highest zenith since 1998, highlighting the company's most stellar year to date. Now, Betancourt Myers' golden touch primarily emanates from her substantial slice of L'Oreal, the beauty mega-brand boasting an arsenal that includes Lancome and Garnier, and flaunted a handsome revenue of $42 billion in 2022. However, not merely content to sit on her laurels, Betancourt Myers plays a pivotal role in shaping the company's destiny. As the chairwoman of the family's holding company, Tethys, and the vice chairwoman of L'Oreal Group's board, she wields considerable influence, underscored by her family's control of over 34% of L'Oreal's stock, and under her strategic guidance, L'Oreal's stock price shot up by 35% in 2023 alone, a surge in value mirroring the company's robust health and the public's insatiable appetite for luxury products. And the company's aggressive growth strategy was evident in its recent acquisition of the Australian brand Aesop for a jaw-dropping $2.5 billion, marking L'Oreal's biggest brand conquest. And as of December 2023, L'Oreal's market cap stood at an astounding $267 billion, positioning it as the 36th most valuable company on the entire planet. Furthermore, the company's formidable growth trajectory outpaced the global beauty market, with a particularly strong showing in Europe, and L'Oreal's savvy approach to technology hasn't gone unnoticed. By focusing on solving tangible challenges over mere technological showmanship, its product launches have reaped dividends, exemplified by Lancome Hapter's recognition in Time's Best Inventions of 2023 in the accessibility category. And in a historic move, L'Oreal's CEO, Nicholas Hieronymus, took center stage at CES 2024, marking the first keynote address by a beauty company at the event. This presentation highlighted L'Oreal's commitment to seamlessly integrating technology across physical, digital and virtual platforms. Underlining the company's forward-thinking ethos and its pivotal role in shaping the future of beauty and technology. However, while we tally up the sumptuous sales figures and have our collective breaths taken away by such forward-thinking financial brilliance, it's easy to forget that $260 billion behemoths like L'Oreal don't come out of a vacuum. In fact, when we peel back the layers of the L'Oreal's monumental wealth, a drama is revealed that is one part rags-to-riches period piece, one part crime thriller, 
with the family's mysterious rise to wealth beginning in the hotly contested region of Alsace between France and Germany in the late 19th century. The seeds of what would become the colossal cosmetics giant known as L'Oréal begin with the birth of their controversial patriarch, Eugene Schuler, in Europe's Alsace region in 1881. First, Schuler's academic prowess in chemistry, honed at France's National Chemical Engineering School, laid the foundation for his future business triumphs. Graduating in 1904, his flair for chemistry and entrepreneurial ambition were already evident. And in 1909, at the tender age of 28, Schuler ventured into the entrepreneurial world, establishing what would evolve into L'Oréal. His foray into the beauty industry began with the development of one of the first hair dyes, Oreal, a product that quickly caught the attention of Parisian hairdressers for its quality and efficacy. He then astutely registered his burgeoning enterprise as La Société Française de Teinture Inoffensive pour Cheveux and developed an approach to business and product development firmly rooted in two core principles, relentless research and groundbreaking innovation. For the scientist-turned-cosmetics guru, this ethos was not just a set of ideals, but a practical strategy that guided L'Oreal's expansion into diverse beauty segments, including skin care, hair care, sun protection and makeup. Thus, relentless research for Schuler meant an unwavering commitment to scientific exploration and understanding. For instance, Schuler's chemistry expertise led him to seek innovative formulas for hair dyes that were safer and more effective than the harmful ingredients commonly used at the time. On the other hand, Groundbreaking innovation under Schuler's leadership was about more than just following existing trends in cosmetics. It was about creating new ones. This principle of innovation pushed the boundaries of what was considered possible in the beauty industry, and Schuler's drive for innovation further led to the diversification of L'Oreal's product range. However, Schuler's trailblazing journey was not without its hurdles, especially in perfecting the hair dye formula. One notable challenge was the development of a safe and effective hair dye. You see, early iterations of hair dyes in those days were known to use harsh chemicals, posing risks to users. Schuler spent considerable time and resources to develop a formula that was not only effective in colouring hair, but also safe for consumers, and his persistence paid off, culminating in a product that was both effective and safe. With this, the early 1910s saw the rise of L'Oréal then still known as the Société Française de Teinture Inoffensive pour Cheveux, and Schuler's aforementioned iconic hair dye, L'Oréal, had marked the onset of L'Oréal's long-standing legacy in the beauty industry. But Schuler's vision was not limited to hair care. L'Oréal soon ventured into skin care and other beauty products, and by 1920, the company had three chemists on its payroll. Later decades saw a period of strategic expansion and diversification for the company laying the foundation for its future status as a leading force in the cosmetics industry. The 1930s saw the company broaden its range further, including the groundbreaking introduction of the first sunscreen in 1936. This move underscored L'Oreal's commitment to innovation and its adaptability to evolving consumer needs, and L'Oreal's ability to thrive during the challenging economic climate of the Great Depression was noteworthy. The broader cosmetics industry, paradoxically, saw a rise in sales during this time, even as other sectors struggled. This resilience was partly due to the lipstick effect, a phenomenon where consumers, despite financial constraints, continued to indulge in small luxuries like cosmetics. However, the 1940s presented a more complex scenario for Schuler and L'Oreal. On one hand, Schuler's ambition for the company was clear. With L'Oreal's sales nearly quadrupling from 1940 to 1944, and Schuler's personal wealth growing by leaps and bounds. However, this era was also marred by controversy due to Schuler's political affiliations. You see, at this time, Schuler was associated with far right groups and the Vichy regime, the French government that collaborated with the Third Reich in the early 1940s. Indeed, the Vichy regime, led by Marshal Philippe Pétain, was known for its collaborationist policies with the Nazi occupiers, a stark contrast to the French resistance movement. And Schuler's support for La Cagoule, a French fascist-leaning organization, further complicated his reputation. La Cagoule, also known as the Cagoulards, was involved in espionage, sabotage, and assassination plots 
aiming to overthrow the French Third Republic and establish an authoritarian regime. And Schuller's alleged deeper connections with Nazi invaders were also a significant aspect of this period. He reportedly fostered relationships with prominent Nazis, which likely aided the economic success of his business during the war, and his writings and lectures became increasingly pro-Nazi and anti-Republican, reflecting a shift in his public stance towards explicit support of Nazi ideology and opposition to the democratic values of the French Republic. And post-war, Schiller's wartime activities led to an investigation for collaboration with the Nazis. However, he managed to navigate through this precarious period without significant repercussions. And he remained at the helm of L'Oreal, steering the company through the post-war era. With such a controversial stain on its legacy, it was clear by the 1950s L'Oreal needed a rebuilding and a rebranding. Indeed, with the coming baby boom era on the horizon, the stage was set for a compelling chapter in the saga of L'Oreal, leaving the world in eager anticipation of its next grand move. In the 1950s, L'Oreal entered a transformative phase, experiencing explosive growth that would solidify its standing as a global cosmetics powerhouse. The post-war consumer boom, amplified by the glamorous influence of blonde screen idols like Marilyn Monroe, sparked a surge in demand for beauty products. L'Oreal, with its impressive research and development team of 100 by 1950, was primed to capitalize on these burgeoning trends. And the era saw Francois Dahl, who had joined the company during the war, ascend to joint general manager by 1948. Under his guidance, L'Oréal commenced its international expansion, with this period being marked by strategic brand acquisitions and a keen eye for seizing new opportunities encapsulated in their motto, Savoir saisir ce qui commence, or seize new opportunities. By the end of the decade, L'Oréal had not only established a robust international presence, but also garnered a reputation for quality and innovation. And the swinging 60s continued this trajectory of innovation and diversification for L'Oréal. Certainly, the decade was a hotbed for significant advancements in research and development, evident in the brand's establishment of new cosmetological and bacteriological facilities in 1963 and 1964, and the inauguration of a new research and production center in Aulnay-sous-Bois in 1960. These innovative maneuvers eventually brought the research staff count to 300, and soon L'Oréal also embraced the spirit of emancipation that defined the era. Responding to the trend of long hair, popularized by icons like Brigitte Bardot, L'Oréal developed products that catered to this demand while maintaining safety and quality. Furthermore, a pivotal moment came in the 1970s with the launch of the home hair coloring brand, Preference, and its iconic slogan, Because I'm Worth It, resonating with the increasing number of women entering the public sphere and workforce. But the company's strategies in the 60s weren't confined to product innovation. L'Oreal expanded its operations to new markets, establishing a presence in 60 countries by the early half of the decade. And this international expansion was a strategic move to establish a global footprint and cater to diverse consumer needs across various regions. However, at this point in the story, L'Oreal, as a brand and family, was more synonymous with science, business acumen and political controversy than eye-watering wealth. Undoubtedly, the opulent lifestyle and flashy displays of financial freedom many of us know the family for had yet to begin. And it took the birth of a young girl in Paris to get it all started. Liliane Betancourt, born as Liliane Henriette Charlotte Schuler, on the 21st of October 1922 in Paris, France, was the only child of Eugene Schuler and Louise Madeleine Berthe Dancieux, a pianist. Now, unsurprisingly, Liliane's childhood was marked by luxury and privilege. Although the early loss of her mother when she was just five years old added a level of gravitas not often mentioned in recountings of her life story. Growing up in the 1920s, Liliane's life was one of opulence, surrounded by servants, tutors, and a constant flow of high-profile visitors in her Parisian apartment and her home on the Brittany coast. Despite the early loss of her mother, her father made sure she received plenty of attention, and he often brought her to his office and factories, immersing her in the world of business and cosmetics from a tender age. 
Indeed, Lillianne started her hands-on experience in the family business at 15, joining L'Oreal as an apprentice in 1938. There, she learned the craft of mixing cosmetics and labeling shampoo bottles, setting the stage for her future role as the principal shareholder of L'Oreal. And by the early 1950s, Lillianne had climbed the corporate ladder to become vice president of L'Oreal. Certainly, her initial roles in L'Oreal were crucial in shaping its future. She was deeply involved in the company's operations and played a significant role in its expansion. Following her father's death in 1957, she inherited the business and steered it towards new heights, and the 70s and 80s saw significant expansion under Betancourt's influence. She adopted an aggressive expansion strategy, leading to the acquisition of several high-profile brands, such as the French luxury perfume and cosmetics house, US cosmetics company Helena Rubinstein, and luxury fashion retailer Ralph Lauren. Then, in 1974, Betancourt made a strategic move by selling almost half of her L'Oreal stock to Nestlé, forming the French holding company Gesparal. This alliance greatly facilitated L'Oreal's expansion into international markets, particularly in Japan, and the company's structure remained a federation of competitive companies, boasting 147 production and distribution facilities worldwide across five divisions. Additionally, Alongside her husband André and their daughter Françoise Betancourt Myers, Lillianne Betancourt founded the Betancourt Schuler Foundation in 1987. And throughout the 1990s, the foundation dedicated substantial resources to various causes, with a significant focus on supporting scientific research. Thus, by the turn of the 21st century, L'Oréal's ascension to a market leader in the beauty industry was the culmination of strategic decisions and visionary leadership across generations. The company's growth trajectory was not just a matter of chance, but a result of its ability to evolve with its consumer base and effectively anticipate the needs of an ever-growing market. However, all the business success in the world doesn't necessarily grant someone an eagle eye when it comes to love. Therefore, in the final chapter of our saga, we'll see as the one-time richest woman in the world deals with a legendary case of alleged fraud in the romance department. In the early 2000s, the life of L'Oréal heiress Liliane Betancourt took a notable turn with her relationship with François-Marie Bagnier, a well-connected, if mysteriously suspicious, celebrity photographer. Bagnier, known for his connections with public figures and celebrities like Yves Saint Laurent, Pierre Cardin and Johnny Depp, was more than 20 years younger than Betancourt. But their relationship, despite the significant age gap, was reportedly characterized by a deep emotional bond. Many say this connection filled a void in Betancourt's life, shaped by her husband's political pursuits and a growing distance with her daughter, Françoise Betancourt Myers. However, this relationship became a focal point of intense public scrutiny and legal battles in the 2010s. Betancourt's daughter, Françoise Betancourt Myers, the current world's richest woman and family heiress mentioned at the beginning of this video, raised allegations against Bagnier accusing him of exploiting her mother's vulnerability and deteriorating mental health due to Alzheimer's disease. Indeed, Betancourt's gifts to Banya, which included a life insurance policy, art pieces and even a private island, were estimated at a staggering 1.3 billion, yes, billion with a B, euros. Thus, in 2008, Betancourt Myers took legal action against Banya, accusing him of taking advantage of her mother and initiating proceedings to have Betancourt declared mentally incompetent. And the situation was further complicated by Betancourt's declining health and the immense fortune involved. The legal battles spotlighted the complex dynamics of wealth, influence and vulnerability, painting a vivid picture of the challenges faced by one of the wealthiest families in the world and the intricate personal relationships within it. Thus, the betancourt Bagnier trial, one of the most high-profile cases in French history, captivated the public's attention and drew parallels to the Brooke Astor trial. In July 2010, the trial faced an adjournment due to the emergence of tape recordings made by Betancourt's butler, which revealed that Betancourt had initially made Bagnier her sole heir, excluding the L'Oreal shares already signed over to her daughter and grandsons. However, Betancourt later removed Bagnier from her will, and in 2015, Bagnier was convicted of abuse of weakness of Lillianne Betancourt. 
The prosecutor described Banier's influence over Betancourt as overwhelming, comparing it to a spider's control over its prey. Subsequently, Banier was initially sentenced to two and a half years in prison and ordered to pay 158 million euros in damages. Additionally, seven other defendants, including Betancourt's financial advisor, lawyer and notary, were convicted. However, upon appeal in 2016, Banier's sentence was reduced to four years suspended and a 300,000 euro fine, with the other damages cancelled. And the public fallout from the betancourt banier controversy posed a potential risk to L'Oreal's brand perception. The scandal threatened the trust and esteem customers placed in the L'Oreal brand, which could have negatively impacted the company's financial performance. However, L'Oreal's long-standing reputation for product quality, scientific research and brand stability helped mitigate the potential negative impact on its public image. In response to these challenges and the evolving consumer culture, L'Oreal strategically embraced the digital revolution. The company focused on creating unique beauty experiences through a data-driven approach, enabling personalized products and services. Innovations like AI-driven personalized beauty solutions and augmented reality makeup trials set L'Oreal apart in the competitive beauty industry. And financially, L'Oreal maintained a strong position in the beauty industry. In 2020, despite the pandemic-induced decline in the overall beauty market, L'Oreal preserved its profitability. And by 2024, L'Oreal has remained the top player in the beauty industry, significantly outperforming its closest competitor, Unilever. And now it's your turn to share your thoughts. What is your opinion on L'Oreal's legacy? Is it simply a dramatic saga of highs and lows with dark and bright spots? Or are the controversial aspects of it too shady for you to give them a pass? Let us know. We always love hearing from you. And thanks again for joining us for another episode of Old Money Luxury. Cheers. Until next time.